Hey everyone, in this video I am going to talk about Pseudoxanthoma elasticum. If you are visiting my channel for the first time, my name is Dr. Namra Aziz, resident dermatology. I make a lot of educational content. If you haven't subscribed my channel, please click the subscribe button and the bell icon to get notifications. You can also follow me on Instagram at Dr. Namra Aziz. So what is Pseudoxanthoma elasticum? As the name has elasticum in it, we know there is something wrong with the elastic fiber. Pseudoxanthoma elasticum is an autosomal recessive disease characterized by clumped, distorted and calcified elastic fiber. Why would someone get Pseudoxanthoma elasticum? Like I said, it's an autosomal recessive disorder. This makes sense that there must be a mutation responsible for Pseudoxanthoma elasticum. The mutation is in a gene called as ABC-C6 gene which encodes ABC, ATP binding cassette transporter protein. As a result of this abnormal protein, abnormal mineralization occurs. Now let's take a look at how this abnormal mineralization occurs. These are the cells of the liver and these are the normal ABC transport protein attached to them. Under normal condition, ATP and other mineralization inhibitors transport through this ABC transporter protein and enter the blood vessels. It binds ATP, hence it is called as ATP binding cassette transport protein. In Pseudoxanthoma elasticum, due to ABCC6 mutation, these transport proteins are mutated, hence ATP remains inside the cells. ATP is a source of inorganic pyrophosphate. When ATP decreases, inorganic pyrophosphate in the blood decreases. And we all know that decreased phosphate is a signal for body to increase mineralization. In addition to this, other mineralization inhibitors such as Fituin A, Nucleotides 5, Osteopontin are also deficient in the blood of the patients with Pseudoxanthoma elasticum. However, mineralization upregulators such as alkaline phosphatase are increased. This leads to increased calcification. If in one word pathogenesis of Pseudoxanthoma elasticum could be explained, it would be abnormal mineralization. There are three major organs in which calcification occurs. Mid and deep dermis of the skin, Brooks membrane of the eye, media and intima of mid-size arteries. Can calcification occur in other organs? Yes, it can occur in other organs as well, but these are the major organs involved. Now who will get the disease? Females have slightly greater chance to get the disease. Skin changes occur in the childhood, but the diagnosis is not made until serious systemic and ocular complications develop in the third and fourth decade of life. Let's see what will happen when this calcification occurs in different organs. We will start with the skin. Have you ever thought why it is called as Pseudoxanthoma elasticum? Because the characteristic cutaneous finding, which are the yellowish papules, bear some resemblance to the xanthomas. However, they are not actual xanthoma because there is no lipid deposition, hence the name pseudoxanthoma. Yellowish papules in the flexure area is the characteristic lesion, and these papules coalesce in certain areas to form plaques, giving rise to a plucked chicken skin or cobblestone appearance. It is also sometimes called as Moroccan leather appearance. Lateral neck is affected first, with anticubital fossa, popliteal fossa, wrist, axilla, and groin being additional sites of involvement. Periumbilical area is also affected. Sometimes the yellowish material also extrudes through the epidermis, giving rise to perforating pseudoxanthoma elasticum. However, we cannot call a disease pseudoxanthoma elasticum until we also have sagging skin due to impaired function of elastic fibers as they are calcified. Presence of exaggerated mental chin crease has been shown to be sensitive and highly specific finding under the age of 30 years. Mucosa can also be involved with presents as yellowish papules most often on the lower lip. Lesions resemble for this spots. Second important organ would be eyes. Like I said, Brooks membrane of eye is affected and calcified. So first of all, it's very important to know what is Brooks membrane. 
In the eye between retina and choroid, there is a membrane made up of basement membrane of retina, basement membrane of choroid, as well as some supporting material, and this membrane is called as Brooks membrane. Classic eye finding is enjoyed streaks. These streaks represent breaks in the Brooks membrane. Enjoyed streaks appear as slate gray to reddish brown curvy linear bands that radiate from the optic disc. It is important to note that it is characteristic but neither common nor pathognomic. There are other causes of angioid streaks as well, which can easily be remembered by the mnemonic Pepsi. P. Pseudoxanthoma elasticum E. Ehlers-Danlos syndrome P. Paget's disease of the bone S. Sickle cell anemia I. Idiopathic then what would be the most common finding? The most common eye finding is mottling pigmentation of the retina, which is also called as POD orange appearance. This represents a transition between calcified and non-calcified Brooks membrane. Less commonly, macular degeneration, optic trucin, and wing sign can also occur. Wing sign represents pair of hyperpigmented symmetrical patches on either side of angioid streak, such as wings of a hovering bird over a prey. That's why it is called as a wing sign. So what is the pathognomonic sign in the pseudoxanthoma elasticum? It would be comet sign. It's called as a comet sign because some of these whitish spots have tails pointing towards the optic disc. It's important to know the comet sign and the wing sign because both of them are part of the diagnostic criteria of pseudoxanthoma elasticum. Moving on to the next system, cardiovascular system. Mid-sized arteries are affected and progressive calcification leads to the formation of atherosclerotic plaques. Intermittent claudication, renovascular hypertension, myocardial infarction and stroke can occur at an earlier age and can be a cause of death at a younger age than others. Calcified blood vessels of gastric and intestinal mucosa leads to the increased chances of GI bleeding. What will you see in the biopsy of pseudoxanthoma elasticum? Well, like I said, it's a disorder of elastic fiber. It's a no-brainer that you will see distorted, fragmented elastic fibers in the mid and deep dermis. Sometimes stain for elastin, which is called as Warhoff van Giesen stain, and stain for calcium, which is called as Foncusa stain, may be necessary to make the diagnosis. There are some clinical presentations which can resemble pseudoxanthoma elasticum. Actinic damage in older population can resemble pseudoxanthoma elasticum. However, only neck is involved, axilla and groin are spared. And when you do histopathology, there are only degenerated elastic fiber and no calcification. There are some phenotypes which have cutaneous presentation exactly similar to pseudoxanthoma elasticum. These are the patients who are taking d penicillamine patients of CKD, and patients of L-tryptophan-induced eosinophilia myalgia syndrome. Their clinical cutaneous phenotype is exactly similar to pseudoxanthoma elasticum. However, there is no calcification and there is no involvement of eyes and cardiovascular system. Amyloid elastosis in systemic amyloidosis can also present as PXC-like phenotype. However, in histopathology, you will see amyloid deposition. Pseudoxanthoma elasticum-like cutaneous phenotype can also occur in 20% of the patients with beta thalassemia. I have already discussed what you will find on histopathology. Now let's see what other investigations you can run. Serum calcium and phosphate levels should be done and they are normal in a patient with pseudoxanthoma elasticum. Skin biopsy for histopathology will show the changes I have told before. Baseline echocardiogram should be done to see the involvement of the heart. Fundoscopic examination should be done to see the signs and the changes I have told you before. Visual acuity should be checked in every patient. Moving on to treatment, there is no specific treatment for pseudoxanthoma elasticum. Restriction of calcium remains controversial. However, use of excessive calcium should be avoided. Magnesium carbonate supplementation has a role in decreasing calcification in a patient with pseudoxanthoma elasticum and should be prescribed. Surgery can help the cosmetic appearance of the skin. For eyes, activities which increase the pressure in the eye, and can cause injury to the eye should be avoided. 
Laser photocoagulation can be done for the new vascularization in the eye. Intravitreal antivascular endothelial growth factor therapy is done, which can also inhibit new vascularization. For cardiovascular system, control of blood pressure and serum lipids is very very important. Patient should avoid smoking and do exercise. These are pretty much same things which are advised for any peripheral vascular disease. For intermittent claudication, low dose acetyl salicylic acid, pentoxyphylene, celostazole or cropidogrel can be prescribed. Low dose therapy with the acetyl salicylic acid can be done for the cardiovascular disease if not contraindicated. For GI disease, NSAIDs and aspirin should be avoided because they increase the risk of the bleeding. Surgical intervention can also be required if the patient bleeds. Thank you so much for watching my video. The only thing I didn't talk about in this video is the diagnostic criteria of pseudoxanthoma elasticum. I would like you to read it from the books. In case you have any problems, you can comment below. I can make a video on that too. If there is any other question you would like to ask, kindly comment below. I would like to leave you guys with a question that is what is another name of pseudoxanthoma elasticum? If you know the answer, kindly comment below. Asking questions is the best way of learning. Don't forget to subscribe to my channel. You can also follow me on Instagram at Dr. Namra Aziz. See you guys soon. Bye-bye.